Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Tom. I'm an educator here at Chihaw Park and Zoo and at Flint River Aquarium. And I'm very excited to be talking to you all today about a pretty interesting topic and a really important topic because what we're going to talk about is pretty much the source of all energy on Earth. And so today we are going to be talking about radiation from the sun. Um, and so we're going to be talking about different types of radiation, how that radiation is created, why it is impacting us on Earth, how it's impacting us, um, how radiation differs throughout the year. Um, so we're going to talk about the sources of radiation, and how it differs, and then we're going to talk about how different types of radiation can be really important um, and really detrimental to us as people and to different animals in the environment. So there's a lot to unpack here and let's go ahead and get started. So I am going to share my screen with you because I have a PowerPoint that's gonna help make this a lot more easy to understand hopefully. Okay. So we're gonna be talking about radiation. And so first, I wanna start by just talking about what radiation is. How does sunlight even get <clears throat> down to earth where we are and how is it formed? Because it's actually really incredible. So um, we can start with what you see here on the right. That is our sun. This is a diagram of our sun. And what the sun is, is it's actually a star that's formed of gases and most of the gases that form the sun are hydrogen and helium. And so what radiation is, or solar radiation, if we think about it like that, which is a fancy way of saying sunlight, um, what that, the, those different wavelengths of radiation are that come towards the earth are, they are electromagnetic radiation or energy that is emitted from the sun and shines down towards the earth. Now, how does that happen though? How is that radiation formed in the first place so that it can um, come down towards the earth? And so what happens is that there are nuclear fusion reactions that release energy. And now that sounds really fancy and I'm gonna break that down as well. So essentially what happens is I said, there's those two types of gases in the sun, right? There's different, types of matter. There's solids, liquids, and gases, right? Um, so gases are things that are, you know, they don't take up, they don't, you know, form to a certain shape or anything like that. They're free floating. Um, and so those two gases in the sun are hydrogen and helium. And what happens is in the core of the sun, the center, which you can see in this diagram, the core is in the very center, it is very, 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 very hot. And there is a lot of pressure. And because it's so hot, um, hydrogen atoms can smash together. And when they smash together, they form helium. Now, when they're smashing together and they're forming helium, energy is released as a reaction um, from that fusion, that nuclear fusion reaction, energy is released. And so when energy is released, it's released as different wavelengths of solar radiation. And so what we think about, we think about electromagnetic radiation, um, we think about electric, electromagnetic energy, and that falls on a broad spectrum of wavelengths. And so those different wavelengths make up the different types of radiation that are emitted from the sun. And so that's what I was saying. We're gonna talk about the different types of radiation that are emitted from the sun because they fall on a spectrum. And some of them are gonna be things that we're much more used to on a daily basis um, or think about much more often on a daily basis and some are not. Now, what's really important too is I mentioned that these fusion reactions or these smashing of atoms um, takes place in the core. And that's important because then after that happens, before 
the solar radiation or the, and there's different types of radiation or energy that's emitted before it even gets to the earth, it has to work its way through the sun, right? Because it's happening. Those reactions are happening at the very center of the sun. So um, you can see that energy is still gonna have to travel through the radiation zone and the convection zone before it even gets to the solar surface of the sun, which is nice because by the time it gets there, it's cooled down enough because it, remember it's really hot in the center of the sun. It's cooled down enough that um, it's in an energy form that is what we see. So when we look at the sun, we see it, it's bright. So that's when it's in a cooled down form. And that energy again is released as solar radiation. Um, and essentially radiation in general is the emission of any type of energy in the form of waves or particles through a space or material medium. So in this case, right, um, that solar radiation is gonna be released through space and it's gonna have to travel through different layers before it even reaches earth. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but essentially that's what solar radiation is. And then we can talk about the different forms. So I apologize, this figure is a little bit more blurry than I would like it to be, but it still looks like we can see it all. And so um, what you can see is that all of the different wavelengths or types of radiation and energy that comes towards the earth from the sun varies on a spectrum. So different types of radiation have and different types of wavelengths of energy that come towards us have different levels of energy and they have different wavelengths. So the first one I wanna bring everybody's attention to is the one that says light. And that's the one that has the colors at the bottom. And that's important because that is the range of visible light. So that is the thing that we as humans can see. So, um, Different objects have different colors, right? Plants are green, <clears throat> water is blue. And that's because um, different things reflect back different colors and can absorb different wavelengths. So that spectrum of 380 to 780 um, is what we can see. We can see in general from about 300 to 700. Um, that's the visible layer that we can see of light. And that is also a really important source of radiation or light because that is the, what is believed the photosynthetically active type of radiation. So in other words, that's the type of sunlight that's coming from the sun that's really important to plants. <clears throat> so I mentioned, right, we we're gonna talk about some really important uses of sunlight and why it's very important that we understand, understand it. And that's because um, I mentioned too that you know, the sun is the source of pretty much all energy that controls what happens on our planet. And so one of the biggest reasons that's a main source of energy is because plants create the foundation for pretty much all of our ecosystems, right? They take in sun and they use it for photosynthesis to make food. And that food works its way up through food webs and food chains in all different types of ecosystems. So I'm not sure if I've talked to this group yet um, about food webs and food chains, but essentially plants have to have sunlight to create photosynthesis, which is where they merge carbon dioxide and water to make sugars and therefore energy. And so when plants are eaten by animals and animals are eaten by other animals, essentially plants create the foundation um, and source of energy that can get transferred throughout food webs and up to higher organisms in higher trophic scales, such as us. So, right, we eat animals such as cows that eat plants. So essentially all that energy is coming from plants originally, but it's not really coming from plants. It's even starting further back towards the sun. So the sun is providing that initial light for plants to get energy, right? So super, super important. Not only does are we adapted to see light and use light to see what's around us and um, see throughout the day, right? Um, and so that's, and so are animals. Animals are adapted to see during the day as well. 
And so not only is it a visible light form, but it's also the light form that's used by plants for photosynthesis. So that one is very, very important. And then if you look on the spectrum of wavelengths to the right of light is what says infrared light or radiation. And that's the type of radiation that's used to heat things. So that's where heat energy comes from. That is what is responsible for creating different temperatures and heat. Um, and so that one's also very important. Now we don't see heat, right? But we know that things have different temperatures. Um, and so that one is obviously very important to us as well. And we care about that. Temperatures play a big role in lots of things. Again, not to come back to plants, but temperature can be a limiting factor for different plants. So for example, <clears throat> if it's warmer, more plants may be able to grow, whereas cold environments are sometimes limited in what kind of plants can survive there or grow there. And so that's really important as well. And then in just a bit here, we are going to talk about UV, which is to the left of our visible light as another source of radiation. Um, and we're going to talk about that one in a little bit as well. But I just want to bring your attention to the fact that, you know, these different sources of light have different energy levels um, and different wavelengths and the different types of radiation play really important roles in our environment and in our everyday lives. Okay, but we can talk about, oh, sorry, my box is gonna cover that text. I put it in the wrong spot. Um, but what we can also talk about is solar iridians. Um, iridians. And what that is essentially is the intensity of the radiation that's entering the atmosphere. And so um, we can kind of think about that intensity as those different wavelengths have different energy, right? So right off the bat, um, the different types of radiation are gonna have different um, levels of energy coming towards the earth. But also, even if we're just focusing on one type of radiation, there are going to be factors that alter how intense the sun is that is reaching the earth. So let's think about um, the visible spectrum of light that we can see and that is photosynthetically active for plants. Um, and there are different things that are gonna influence how intense that sun is. And so we can think about things like um, on a daily basis, the intensity of sun shifts, right? So we have different hours of light um, at night. We're not getting any sunlight during the day when it's say around noonish or one-ish right now. Um, that's when the sun feels the hottest and it's the most direct. Uh, and that's because we have different motions of the earth, right? So again, we know the sun now is coming or, or those radiation waves are coming from the sun, but there are ways in which the earth moves that influences how we interact with the sun. And so if you think about it, our days are 24 hours long, right? And that's because the earth is rotating around the axis. And so when we are rotating in a way that we are facing the sun, that's gonna be when the sun is most direct and that's when it's gonna feel the warmest and it's gonna have the most intensity in a day. Um, but then there are other things that happen as well. So the earth orbits the sun, right? It revolves around the sun and that takes 365 days. And that's how we um, come up with the length of time for our year, right? And so the orbit of the earth around the sun is a slight ellipse. So it's not a perfect circle, which means at times the earth is gonna be closer to the sun than other than at other times. And you would think that distance to the sun would play an important role in intensity of the sun <clears throat> and creating our seasons, some that are hotter or warmer than others, but that's actually not really the case. The, uh, the, the rotation, or I should say the revolution around the sun doesn't actually play that strong of a role in the seasons compared to this other factor, which is the tilt of the sun. So not only do we rotate around the sun, <clears throat> but our earth 
is not found straight up and down on the pole, it's actually slightly tilted. And so when the sun is working around, or when the earth is working around the sun on that tilt, different areas of earth or different locations on earth are gonna either be tilted away from the sun or towards the sun. So let's think about um, the more Northern hemisphere, North of the equator. Uh, we, during the winter, right? We have less sunlight during the day. We have shorter days and the sun isn't as intense. And that's because we are slightly tilted away from the sun during that portion of our revolution around the sun. And so when we're tilted away from the sun, there is a greater angle at which the sun hits the earth. And so essentially there's more, the, the same amount of solar radiation is gonna get spread out over that greater angle and it's gonna get spread out over a greater area. And so it's not gonna be as intense and it's not gonna be as warm. And then what also happens is there's just gonna be shorter days because um, there's gonna be less exposure to the sun when we're tilted away from it as the axis um, as we do our just our rotation, our 24 hour rotation, less of that 24 hours is going to fall um, in line with the sun. So between less intensity, even when the sun is hitting the surface uh, in the northern hemisphere during the winter and shorter days altogether, that's really going to reduce um, the intensity of the radiation during the winter. Now on the opposite end of the spectrum, during the summer, when we're rotating at that same tilt, we are then at some points when we're on the other end of the spectrum, we are tilted towards the sun. So that's when we have our longer days and that's when the sun shines more directly on the Northern hemisphere. And so the sun is gonna be a lot more intense during those summer seasons. Um, and that's why it's warmer and it's hot. Um, and that's when, and that's why we can get burned a little bit more easily from the sun. And we're going to talk about that. Remember, we're going to talk about different types of wavelengths and solar radiation. Um, and so that's going to come into play in a little bit. But so I wanted you all to understand that um, the impact of solar radiation or the intensity of it, which we're talking about right now, is going to be impacted by those different motions of the earth in relation to the sun. But that's not the only thing either. So I have a picture of clouds on here. And that's important because clouds can actually um, reflect some wavelengths back towards space and away from the earth. And so depending on how cloudy it is, um, that's going to influence how intense the sun is. And that kind of makes sense, right? When we're outside and it's a cloudy day, it's cooler and we don't get as hot. Um, but we know we can still get burned, right? If we're let's say at the beach or something and it's and it's cloudy, we know there's still some solar radiation getting through the clouds. They don't completely block it out, but we know we're less likely to get hot and we're less likely to burn, right? Um, and so clouds are a big source of um, scattering wavelengths, solar radiation and reflecting it. So that's also really important that different you know, environmental conditions like cloudiness or even the amount of water vapor, such as humidity that's in the air can also play a role in how much solar radiation is absorbed or reflected or scattered around. So there are a number of different um, variables that can affect how much, how intense the sun is essentially. And then one other one, I don't want to forget is just elevation in general. Um, so if you are found at sea level, essentially, or really close to the ground, the sun may not be as intense because it's not as close. Whereas if you are at a much higher elevation, the sun could be a little bit more intense. And so um, your elevation could impact the intensity of the sun as well. Okay, but another really big factor that can impact um, the intensity of sunlight or of solar radiation in the different forms is the atmosphere and the ozone. And so um, the atmosphere is essentially gases or a la layers of gases that surround the earth or other planets. And so those are gonna be really important for controlling the intensity of sun as well. And so 
Um, the ozone is found, in the, is found in the upper and lower layer of the atmosphere, and it's a gas composed of three oxygen atoms. And so some is naturally forming through the combination of oxygen and, sol and UV ultraviolet radiation, which is another form that we haven't talked about yet, right? So we've talked about infrared, infrared being important for heating and um, the visible spectrum, which is what we can see, which is important for photosynthesis. But then further on the spectrum was um, ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, right? And if you remember that spectrum, it, it's a it has more energy, um, so it can be a bit more impactful. And um, it can help create that ozone layer. But because it's you know part of the natural process of creating that ozone layer, that also means the ozone layer is absorbing some of that UV light, which is important and it's um, beneficial because that light has really strong energy. Um, so it's gonna be important that we don't absorb all of it. Um, and so, kind of related to the seasons to the greater the angle is going to be, the more atmosphere and ozone um, radiation is going to have to travel through and more of it is going to get, there's more opportunity then for it to get reflected or absorbed. And so less is going to reach um, the earth because of that as well. And that will also help reduce intensity of the sun or limit the intensity of the sun which is another really important factor that I should have mentioned earlier when we were looking at the different um, ways in which the earth moves in relationship to the sun. So not only does the angle just reduce the amount of area or intensity of the sun because of the direct angle, um, it also impacts what it has to move through, such as our atmosphere. Okay. So let's talk about ultraviolet radiation. Um, it's a form of radiation that's also emitted from the sun. It, you can see um, at the top portion of that spectrum again, it's got the most energy. And so it's the form of radiation that has the most energy that can reach the sun. So actually um, you can see it's broken down into three different categories which is UV, A, B, and C. And so C is furthest on the left on that spectrum, which means it has the most energy. Um, but fortunately that gets completely uh, absorbed by the ozone. It doesn't reach the earth. Whereas some of UVB gets absorbed by the ozone, uh, but some of it also reaches the earth and all of A reaches the earth. Um, and it's the weakest of the different um, types of UV radiation, but it can also penetrate the furthest into the earth um, and therefore into us. So uh, UV light is really important for a couple reasons um, and it's also dangerous in some ways. And so um, the reason it's important or it's helpful or one benefit I should say of UV radiation is that it can help um, produce vitamin D for us. So it's a source of vitamin D, which is important because that helps us to absorb um, nutrients from our food, um, such as calcium and phosphorus. And so that's gonna be important in building strong bones and muscle mass. Um, and that's things that are important to us. We wanna have healthy bones, we wanna have um, muscle in our bodies. And so it can be beneficial, it does have some benefits, but it's also the source of radiation that is dangerous to us if we get exposed to it too much. So it's a source of radiation that can create sunburn. Um, it can age our skin. It can be harmful if there's too much exposure to it. So sunburn is just a short term, uh, you know, side effect of exposure at a short term, but if you're exposed to the sun too much or you're repeatedly burned, it can, it can make you sick in the long term. Um, and it can have some really negative impacts. Um, and so there's different ways in which we can counteract this that we know of. Um, hopefully you all wear some sunscreen when you know you're gonna be exposed to the sun for prolonged periods of time, especially if it's gonna be sun that has high intensity during the summer. Um, 
or on days when it's going to be really sunny, right? Um, so that's really important. You can do things like wear a hat that's going to directly limit exposure to the sun or even put layers on. Uh, I know they can be hot and warm, but they will help protect your skin, which is really important because again, um, UV radiation can be harmful to us if we are overexposed to it. But we are not the only animals that are influenced by UV light or radiation. And so um, I have another example here, which is birds. So birds are pretty interesting in that they can actually see more light than we can or more wavelengths than we can. So wavelengths are measured um, by nanometers. So we can see again that visible spectrum of around 380 to 780 nanometers of wavelength, but birds can actually see part of the UVA spectrum as well. And so their um, vision can go down to, I believe as low as about 320, which doesn't get all the way to UVB, right? But it is part of it. And this poses some interesting, um, some interesting challenges or opportunities to protect birds. So I'm actually gonna talk about um, how we've kind of learned about a way in which we can protect birds, knowing that they can see um, a source of light that we can't. So if anybody's familiar with bird ecology, um, we know flight is very important for them, especially during migration and processes like that. And um, what I have pictured here are some gulls. So especially gulls that um, are found near ocean environments in the beach, they may be impacted by things like wind turbines, which we use to generate energy, right? Um, and there are other birds. There's lots of studies on birds that um, collide with wind turbines. And unfortunately, um, this can be a source of mortality for birds. And so there's lots of research to mitigate the impacts of human structures. So um, mitigate means find a way to resolve the issues or to fix the problems that we are creating for animals. So um, of course we put up those wind turbines and if those wind turbines are gonna hurt animals, um, that's because of us. So we have to find ways that we can minimize how much we are hurting animals or impacting animals as a result of structures that we put in place. Um, and so they kind of had this idea of, well, if these birds can see a type of light that we can't, why can't we utilize that to help protect them? And so they had this idea that they could generate UV light at this, on a portion of the spectrum that we can't see and therefore it won't impact us, but that it may impact these birds because vision is one of their primary senses that they really rely on and they don't like it. So when they're flying, they try to avoid light. Um, I think about it as like, we don't want to stare at the sun, right? That's not comfortable and we don't want to just stare at it. So we avoid looking directly into the light. Um, well, birds similarly are going to avoid flying into highly lit areas. And so they have this idea that they could build these structures that they can put on the wind turbines that would shine upward, right? They don't want to generate something that they're going to shine down towards people and harm people more. Um, so they kind of had this idea to build structures that's going to shine UV light in a form that only the birds can see, so we're not creating any light pollution either, up towards the blades of the wind turbines. And they did an actual study on this and recorded their results. And what they found is that birds actually increased the, the altitude of their flight by about seven meters when they use this light. Um, and so in other words, they were going to fly above the wind turbines and not get hit by them anymore, or at least reduce how many birds um, would get hit by these wind turbines. Or they found that birds would just avoid these areas altogether. So not necessarily even fly over the light or the wind turbines, but just avoid the wind turbines. Um, and so abundance was reduced around these wind turbines, which is good because that means they're going around them and hopefully there's gonna be less collisions. Um, and the reason they also made them down and pointed up is not just because we want to not impact people, but because um, birds oftentimes take a lot of visual cues from what's below them. 
and kind of respond to things that's below them. And that makes sense, right? Because they're going to be trying to hunt things that are below them, looking what's, you know, they're looking at what's going on. There's more stimulus on the ground than there is up above them probably. Um, and so they had this idea that if they shined upwards, the birds would kind of cue in on that. And that's probably why they were going up and above. Um, so really interesting to think about that, you know, animals fall on different spectrums than we do in terms of the energy or the solar radiation that they can see. Uh, but a really cool example of how they could use that to help protect these birds. Now, with that being said, there's probably other studies on um, if UV light uh, deters natural areas in which they can fly. Um, but this is a cool example of a way that can be used in a good way. Now, UV radiation and light can also have some negative impacts on animals. And so um, does anybody know what's pictured here? So these are amphibian larvae found in the water. So on the right, those are egg masses laid in the water. Um, those are relatively undeveloped eggs on the right. So those are the embryos that are just starting to develop. And then on the left, those are embryos that have developed and are getting pretty close to hatching out of the eggs. So those are larval salamanders found in the eggs. You can see the gills starting to form. Um, but what I want to mention is that there's lots of animals that can be impacted like we are negatively by UV radiation. And so one thing that it can do is it can actually um, destroy the DNA of animals or harm the DNA or damage. I shouldn't say destroy, they can damage the DNA of animals. And so um, Oftentimes we'll see animals like salamanders that will behaviorally respond to UV radiation. Um, similar to the birds, so the birds were behaviorally responding, right, by avoiding that light and flying over around it. Um, amphibians, such as salamanders that breed in ponds, will actually strategically place their egg masses in locations within wetlands that avoid um, strong sunlight or exposure to UV radiation. So they may place them in more shaded areas or things like that that may be blocking um, UV radiation. And so even if animals are exposed and DNA is damaged, um, they can still repair it. And so how capable an animal is of repairing DNA damage from UV radiation kind of determines what their tolerance to UV exposure is. And so all animals are going to fall on a range of, you know, how, how well they can tolerate damage from UV radiation. Some animals are going to be able to handle it more than others. Um, and some of that may come back to how well they avoid it to begin with altogether. Um, but, you know, there's concern that there may be more UV exposure in the future. And so, um, behavioral adaptations or changes to get around that naturally without us even playing a role is going to be really important and really interesting. And so um, just to provide a little thought on how much is reaching us right now. So um, I was mentioning there's lots of different factors that can influence the intensity of radiation from the sun. And so um, different things impact the intensity. And I was talking about the atmosphere and uh, the ozone can absorb some radiation. So right now, only about 48% of energy from the sun in the form of radiation is reaching the Earth's surface. And that's because um, the atmosphere actually reflects some right back out towards space and towards the sun. The atmosphere can absorb some of the solar radiation within the atmosphere itself. And the ozone is also gonna absorb some of the UV radiation in that layer. And so between reflectance and absorbance, um, only about 48% of the sun's energy and radiation is actually reaching the earth. Um, and so lots of different things to consider, but a really cool process, really important topic because it's, again, it's pretty much the, the source of all of our energy here on earth. Um, and it's really important that we have that star, the sun that supports us and gives us that energy. So I hope you all learned something from this talk and found it really interesting. I think it's an extremely interesting topic um, and it, and it kind of gives us an explanation of where all of our energy comes from and a base, a basis of our life here on earth. So 
Um, I don't see any questions, but I hope you all enjoyed this and learned something and I hope you all take care.